Uh, this roundtable discussion is part of the Muis Academy's uh, continuous effort to encourage discourse on Islam, Muslims in this modern world. And in fact, our tagline for the Muis Academy is developing religious leadership in this modern world. So we have uh, invited uh, many scholars from different parts of the world to engage in an open and serious discussion in a closed door setting like this. The idea is to allow uh, an open and safe uh, place to engage, however different we may be, however controversial and sensitive the issues may be. Uh, so for that, uh, as, as practiced, uh, a roundtable discussion of this sort, usually we have it as a closed door session. Although we do invite some friends from the media sometimes to participate, but as fellow citizens, but they are not for reporting. So it is a closed door session. Uh, it is not for reporting, nor for tweeting and uploading onto the social media, uh, so that we, we, we feel safe in terms of engaging on issues, inshallah. So um, I would like to welcome Professor Shah and friends, uh, Dr. Faisal, as well as Dr. Agis, to, to, to the Sunday Council of Singapore. And friends uh, from NUS, uh, our religious leaders, our, our Asadza, I see some of them here, and uh, our legal practitioners and lawyers, also. So these are senior practitioners, uh, so we can share a bit more. Uh, just as uh, by way of introducing this topic, I think the topic Sharia law. Uh, itself is a, uh, I thought the word Sharia always invites a range of responses, uh, understandings and misunderstandings, interpretations and misinterpretations. Uh, and uh, the, uh, really the word conjures up different meanings in different minds. Uh, and I thought the name itself, Sharia law, uh, can be problematic, some misnomers uh, that sort. Uh, uh, it is almost like the term adat law when when Hobonia introduced the word adat law that has caused uh, a great deal of tension or, or problems or uh, a great deal of confusion. So the reason we are here is to really see and uh, assess um, our understanding and how, how do we really implement Sharia law because I think we can hardly find one model of implementation of Sharia law. We need to consider the, the different contexts in time and space. Not only throughout the long history of Sharia, but even at the same era, at the same period, and neighboring countries, Singapore and Malaysia may have different experiences in terms of implementation of uh, Islamic law. So for that, I think we, we, we ought to take that, we, we ought to bear in mind the, the uniqueness of each context. And here, we are happy to have Mr. Shah to share with us uh, an experience. Here we are drawing from the Malaysian experience and see how we can learn from this uh, uh, from this experience. Uh, and inshallah, Prashad uh, has taken upon himself this daunting task of discussing the complex interplay between civil and Sharia law in the global society, the Malaysian experience. I would also like to take this opportunity to welcome Dr. Muhammad Fazal Musa, a research fellow from the Institute of Malay World and Civilization, ATMA of, of the UKM, as well as Dr. Abiyas Nubelija, a senior lecturer, uh, gender studies program at the University of Malaya. Together with Professor Shad, both of the Fazal and the are here to talk at a, semin at a seminar on extremism and reform in the Malay world, organized by the Malay Studies Department of the National University of Singapore. Uh, and I thank both Dr. Noaisha and Dr. Fadi Atas for, for this kind collaboration with, with Moose Academy, inviting them to, to this round table discussion. Let me just briefly introduce Dr. Professor Shad Salim. Dr. Professor Shad Salim is no stranger, is, is, uh, uh, no stranger to this Malaysian scholarly legal world. He is a senior professor of law and a legal advisor to the UITM, University of Technology Mara as well as University Sultan Zainal Abidin, UNISA, or what used to be known as KUSA, for this University Islam Zainal Abidin, and UC Science Malaysia, Penang. 
So up from north down to the south. <laughs> well, probably you should consider Johor with <laughs> Tianjin. So we have covered Malaysia from its northern tip to the southern tip. <laughs> uh, he has served the University of Yomana in various capacities uh, from 1971. That is like for 44 years. 44 years. <laughs> if I get my maths correct. <laughs> he has served as a head of diploma in the law program, as a assistant rector, as well as assistant vice chancellor, uh, vice chancellor and his legal advisor until this present day as a legal advisor. He has also served on the faculties of law at IIUM. I understand from Dr. Sushar that Prof. Ahmad Ibrahim was his supervisor, and Prof. Ahmad Ibrahim uh, was the drafter of and Mrs. Dr. Muslim Law Act. And this room, this is the plot room, is named after Prof. Ahmad Ibrahim. And he is obviously a teacher to many of us here. Um, he has also served uh, as a professor at UKM, University of Bansan Malaysia, as well as uh, USM, University of Science Malaysia. Professor Shad has completed over 430 articles. Wow, that's... <laughs> <laughs> and over 300 seminar papers in various countries. Uh, it's a long list of countries, but you can imagine any part of the world, from uh, uh, states US up to Australia, so he has been to all these places. And he's currently awaiting the launch of his latest book, Reflections of Life and the Law. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> I guess this is not so much a, a, a research work, but more of a wisdom from a researcher and a practitioner in the area of uh, Confession. Confession. <laughs> <laughs> now we will look forward to that. <laughs> um, we, we, we have our guests, inshallah. Uh, we, would, we will invite, I mean, the, the reason I was inviting Professor Shah as well as, uh, as the other colleagues is to, to contribute, inshallah. Um, Professor Shah will uh, give some uh, remarks about this topic. Uh, probably about. Uh, 30 minutes to 40 minutes or so. And uh, I understand that Prof. Faisal has uh, also prepared something for, for, for this uh, discussion. So we will invite, uh, when time permits, inshallah, for Prof. Faisal to share some of his reflections and his research on the topic. And then we will open up for uh, an open discussion. Uh, and I'm sure Prof. Shah will be more than happy to respond to your queries and, and comments, inshallah. So without further ado, can I invite the short please to present uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Yeah, thank you very much for the honor of this invitation. Uh, it's quite uh, poignant for me to be in a room named after Sri Ahmad Ibrahim. He was actually like a father uh, and of course a teacher to me. Um, the broad theme, of course, is interplay, but my specific uh, presentation will be challenges in the implementation of Sharia in Malaysia. Now, as we all know, um, the Constitution of Malaysia in Article 3, Clause 1, declares that Islam is the religion of the Federation. Um, I think for the first 25 years or so, um, Islam was regarded primarily as something symbolic, ceremonial. Um, but since the 80s or mid 80s, a large part of the Muslim community wishes to transform Islam from a mere ceremonial thing and a guide for Muslim personal law only. Uh, they want to transfer, transform it into the central feature of the social, legal, and economic system. Um, what are the causes, or the reasons for this? Um, there may be political causes, but Professor Kamal Hassan, uh, formerly of University of Islam, used to say, you must take note also 
of the substantive virtues, the virtues of the religion. Uh, that was his, his view that the rise of Islam is because its ideas are appealing to people. So uh, what the causes were, the Iranian revolution or uh, the interplay between Amno and Abbas, I think that's a separate and more interesting issue. But I think since the 80s, Islamization has been very much uh, uh, part of the political life of Malaysia. However, it must be understood that implementing the Sharia, uh, adopting Hudud laws, will be a long journey and not a quick destination. Uh, there are many constitutional, legal, political, economic, social, ethnic, and international hurdles in the path. Um, of course, those, those who wish to uh, promote Islamization and the Sharia um, will say it's all worth it. Yes, but um, I, I think when you want to bring about a change, you must be level-headed about what the price is, what the problems are, and that's what I wish to point out to you. Um, first of all, there are constitutional considerations. Uh, um, the federal constitution is supreme, Article 4, Clause 1. Um, unlike in Pakistan or many other countries, the Sharia is not the supreme law of the Federation. It's the constitution that is the supreme law. And courts have laid down that the Sharia does not supply the litmus test of validity. It's the constitution that supplies the criterion of whether a law is valid or not. In other words, you can't go to the courts in Malaysia uh, and have a law declared illegal simply because the law violates Sharia provisions. You have to have something more. You have to refer to a constitutional provision. Federal parliament is limited, state assemblies are limited, we have 13 state assemblies, unconstitutional legislation and administrative actions can be invalidated by the courts, there is judicial review, there is a federal state division of legislative and executive powers. Um, basically, most of the power belongs to the federal government, uh, but some areas, uh, specifically Islamic family law, has been assigned to what is called the state list. Now, uh, it is believed by many people that Islamic law being in the state list, um, therefore the states have very wide powers to enact any law on Islam, and I'm sure you all agree with me. Islam is not only about marriage and divorce and inheritance. Islamic law covers uh, uh, civil and criminal, commercial, banking, tort, taxation, even law of war and peace. The Islamic law is like any other field of jurisprudence. It's very broad. However, this, it must be clarified that in Malaysia, Schedule 9, List 2, Paragraph 1, confers powers on the state assemblies to enact laws only on 22 specified Islamic matters. Most important is Islamic personal law. Um, Islamic family law plus some other personal law matters. Um, banking, the Hajj pilgrimages are in federal hands. Uh, of course, uh, contract, trusts are all in federal hands. So the power of the states to enact Islamic law is uh, limited. It's residual, it's prescribed in the constitution. Um, federal parliament, on the other hand, has a lot of power on Islamic law, uh, including um, <coughs> criminal law. Uh, so criminal law is mostly in federal hands. In fact, I would say almost all of it is in federal hands except uh, uh, those matters not covered by the penal code. 
and this afternoon we were discussing issues like not fasting, not saying Friday prayers, khalwat, um, these uh, may be in state hands, these are in state hands, but the entire field of criminal law is in federal hands. This is an important point because it is the states that are pushing, especially the states of Kalantan and Tranganu that are pushing for hudud, for Sharia laws, and the constitutional objection is that this is this is ultra virus your powers. Further, the constitution includes many fundamental rights for everyone, Muslim, the non-Muslims alike, and any law with the federal or state has to comply with the fundamental rights. A very significant issue that has come up in Malaysia today is this. If a state assembly passes a law in the name of Islam, can it violate fundamental rights? Or do fundamental rights get suspended the moment you invoke the word Islam? Islamic or Sharia law enactment. Can you therefore ignore chapter on fundamental rights? Can you ignore the federal state division of powers? This is one issue that needs to be tackled um, because someone may take it to the court and the courts will then be faced with the dilemma of having to make a decision. Um, also, bear in mind that Article 3, Clause 4. Um, Article 3, Clause 4 clearly says that though Islam is the religion of the Federation, nothing in this article derogates from any other provision of this constitution. So the provision for Islam is not overarching, is not superior to other aspects of the constitution, which may well be un-Islamic, but nevertheless, uh, nothing in Article 3 derogates from any other provision of this constitution. Um, Sharia courts since 1988, and that's the contribution of Tanshri Ahmad Ibrahim. He is the one who drafted Article 121.1a. His intention was very noble, and that was that uh, at his time, uh, sometimes the Sharia courts will give a decision on matters of Farayad or on Muslim uh, wasiyat and the parties would challenge it in a civil court, the civil court would apply equity or some other rule of common law or equity and overrule it. And so 121 1A was meant to prevent the civil court, especially the high court, from overturning decisions of the Sharia court on principles of common law or uh, equity. However, what has ha happened sadly is that uh, Article 121.1a uh, has uh, caused a lot of uh, very painful, sometimes embarrassing conflicts between the High Court and the Sharia courts. Uh, so much so that uh, um, many non-Muslims are asking um, if this is Islamic justice, then no thank you. Because um, there are problems that are arising to which solutions have not been found. When Tan Sri Ahmad Ibrahim drafted 121.1a for the AG's office, I think their intention was that in matters of family law, his intention was in matters of family law, the High Court will not interfere with the Sharia courts. But issues have arisen lately uh, about non-Muslim marriages, um, whether the Sharia court can uh, in declare uh, marriage dissolved because one party converted to Islam. The custody of uh, children who were non-Muslims, uh, but who the Sharia court says are now Muslim because the father has converted to Islam. So these very sad uh, issues have come up. They are uh, very, very embarrassing really because um, they lead to a lot of criticism of justice in the Sharia courts. 
or lack of it, uh, criticism by the non-Muslims. Um, so, um, uh, Article 121A, I think, is in need of further uh, amendment. It's too late. Since 1988, it's too late to, to repeal it, of course, and should not be repealed. Sharia courts have a different jurisprudence. It would be quite improper for Gopal Sri Ram, <laughs> uh, a, a Gopal Sri Ram, to uh, give a pronouncement on uh, the, the Quran or the Hadith. I think it should be someone uh, familiar with Islamic jurisprudence. But nevertheless, uh, whether Sharia court should have the power to declare a marriage uh, as having been dissolved, even though one party is still a non-Muslim. These are questions that remain unresolved in the Malaysian legal system. Also, there are questions of unconstitutionality uh, for the civil. Uh, questions of unconstitutionality are raised and questions of unconstitutionality are obviously for the civil courts. They can't be for the Sharia courts. There are further problems. Sometimes the parties are asking for a remedy which remedy is not available in the Sharia court. Uh, for example, uh, everyone knows about the writ of habeas corpus. So you are asking the court for habeas corpus to release the person from what he says is unlawful detention. Um, the party is a Muslim. Uh, order was given by the Sharia court to detain someone. Uh, can habeas corpus lie? Habeas corpus under the rules of Malaysia lies only before the High Court. So where should it go? So there are lots of disputes um, uh, about the Sharia Court's jurisdiction that are causing problems uh, to our legal system. Um, disputes when one party uh, to the whole dispute is a uh, non-Muslim. Disputes when Sometimes international law is involved. A marriage between two Muslims was contracted in Europe, but then they came to Malaysia. Um, so who handles who handles the case? Is it a Muslim marriage to be determined by the Sharia court or with the civil courts examine? There have been cases, and in one case, a high court said, since this marriage was under civil law, the civil law will adjudicate on it. I'm not saying that that is, nice, that is right. I'm saying is these problems are arising. Sometimes international law is involved. We had one very embarrassing case where a Malay lady had married a Chinese gentleman in Singapore. Um, and they had gone for a nice holiday in Cameron Highlands. <laughs> and uh, they were picked up by the Sharia authorities. The lady was picked up for living in sin. Because she had not con he he had not converted. There was a civil law marriage yeah, as is allowed in Singapore, as used to be allowed in Indonesia at one time, as is allowed in uh, many other countries like India. So she was picked up and uh, charged uh, with uh, living in sin. But the Attorney General uh, instructed the Sharia prosecutor to lay off. This is an international case layoff, and so they didn't. Uh, they dropped the charges, but that was about 15 years ago. Lately, there have been cases where the AG has issued instructions, and the Sharia courts, Sharia uh, authorities have said, "This is a Sharia matter. You have no right to interfere." Uh, in one case, on the return of the Bibles that were seized in Salangor, the AG said. There is no case in criminal law. The Sharia authorities declined to pay heed. And Mentri Basar of Salangor said, return the Bibles. And the Sharia court said, you have no right to interfere with us. <laughs> uh, uh, because this is a matter for the Sultan. The Sultan is in charge of Islam and so you should not interfere. So we, we are having some problems here. And I hope and pray to Allah that these problems can be resolved amicably with justice to both sides. But at the moment, everything is being swept under the carpet. The executive uh, doesn't have the political guts to take a stand. 
it's leading it to the courts. The courts are begging their executive to please amend the law and solve the problem. Uh, Tun Hamid uh, from Pinang, uh, who was the Chief Justice at one time, in a judgment he said, he used the word beg, he said, we beg the legislature to take a stand and provide a guidance on how these cases should be resolved. But uh, on Parliament side there is thunderous silence. <laughs> And so the issue basically is uh, that uh, problems remain unresolved. Uh, last year, the police got involved, sadly. Uh, in one particular case, uh, a husband had converted to uh, Islam, uh, gone to the Sharia court immediately to get his marriage dissolved. Uh, get custody of the children, infant children, convert the children to Islam. The wife on the other hand went to the civil courts. The civil court judge said Sharia court has no power to dissolve uh, the Hindu woman's marriage. So um, the Sharia court decision has no application whatsoever. And the conversion is unconstitutional and custody must be given to the mother. Uh, in the interest of the mother because the child is an infant. So there was a Sharia court order one way and the civil court order the other way. And uh, uh, of course the husband did not obey. Husband who had taken away the children did not obey. So the uh, former wife uh, made a report to the police. The IGP on the other hand said, uh, we don't want to take sides. But sometimes not taking sides amounts to taking sides. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's what happened actually. That means the husband had his way. So even though she had a high court order in her favor, and there are federal court decisions which say that Sharia courts cannot dissolve the marriage of a uh, non-Muslim partner of a marriage. That jurisdiction remains with the civil law. So we have, we have these problems and really I, I um, don't know how these problems should be resolved. Uh, we have, uh, some of us have um, sat down and uh, recommended that perhaps the Sultans could play a role, the Majlis Raja Raja could play a role, perhaps Malaysia should have a judicial committee of the Privy Council. Then the Sharia courts and the civil courts are uh, fighting with each other and there is no clear solution and, and Malaysia is not the only country in Pakistan There are serious problems between Sharia courts and civil courts. So maybe what should happen is that there should be a separate court wherever there are jurisdictional conflicts um, Conflict of law situations and the matter should go to this special court on which there should be majority Muslims um, and uh, non-Muslims also should be there and they should then advise the Majlis Raja Raja, the conference of rulers as to how to resolve the dispute. That's one possibility. The second possibility could be that uh, the High Court could create a Sharia division. High Court already has a Muammala division because banking and all commercial transactions uh, are all still in federal hands. Uh, I, I have a contract with you, the matter goes to civil courts even though both of us are Muslims. Uh, I have a bank loan, even with Bank Islam, it goes to the civil courts. So there is a Muammala division in the High Court, perhaps there should be a conflict of laws division in the High Court, consisting of both Malay, uh, Muslim and non-Muslim judges uh, to hear this case. But this will require a constitutional amendment because at the moment Sharia matters are in the civil court's hands and uh, here obviously um, you are asking that the civil court should not hear, the Sharia court should not hear, it should go to a, a special division of the High Court or it should go to the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council. Uh, a third suggestion came from the Mantri Basar of Salam, uh, Mantri Basar of Negri Sambilan just a few weeks ago. Uh, and it has been applauded by many, though it has not yet been implemented. He says, 
anyone who wants to convert out of his religion into Islam, if he is married, he must first get his marriage dissolved. So, divorce first, convert afterwards. Uh, that is his suggestion. So there will be no problem about uh, one party going here, one party going there. Uh, and the civil law will apply to the dissolution of the marriage. It was contracted under civil law, it must dissolve under civil law. But as I was mentioning this morning, uh, this won't be so easy to implement because if a law like that is passed, those uh, who want to convert will say, well, it's my right under the Constitution. So I, I think we are very much in a um, gray zone. We don't know which way we should go. Um, and one, uh, now coming to the issue of Hudud law is uh, um, two states, Kalantan and Turanganu have passed Hudud laws and uh, they have not been implemented as yet. The reason for that is this, that uh, the Hudud laws are a clear violation of the federal state division of power. Crime is in federal list, uh, whereas the Hudud laws as passed right now uh, basically deal with theft, robbery, rape, murder and incest and these are obviously matters in uh, federal jurisdiction. Uh, please don't get me wrong, I'm not in any way suggesting that these things should not be punished. Um, what I'm saying is who should punish? The issue is who should be enacting the laws. A at the moment, these laws are basically federal laws, but the states want to pass these laws. So that's one problem. The federal state division of power uh, is a constitutional issue. Uh, number two, Sharia courts have no jurisdiction over non-Muslims. Uh, the Hudud laws both say the Hudud law will apply to Muslims and to those non-Muslims who consent to be subjected to the Hudud law. Now, with all due respect, this is a very clever and sincere, possibly sincere uh, suggestion, but it's legally not proper. Jurisdiction is not a matter of consent. Jurisdiction is a matter of law. I may agree to be tried by a court martial. I trust the court martial more than I trust the magistrate's court. But too bad, court martial cannot try me because I'm not a military officer. I have to go before the ordinary court. So, jurisdiction cannot come from acquiescence. Jurisdiction must come from the law. So, I don't think Sharia courts can try non-Muslims, even if the non-Muslim consents. Thirdly, penalties. Uh, that may be imposed by the Sharia courts are prescribed by federal law. The federal law is Sharia Courts Criminal Jurisdiction Act 1965, which imposes the 356 formula um, three years jail, uh, 5,000 ringgit fine, six strokes of the rotan. So, in the Udud uh, uh, enactments, um, stoning to death, amputation, uh, in some cases, imprisonment till the person repents, till he repents. That would be beyond uh, the Sharia Court's criminal jurisdiction. Act. So I think that's a problem. Uh, uh, fourthly, uh, those who commit offenses like uh, uh, being a murtad, they will be subject to prison sentences. Uh, they, they will not be stoned to death, they will be subject to prison sentences reformatories, rehabilitation centers. Here again there is a problem because uh, prisons, etc. are actually in the uh, federal hands. Hurdle number five, even if, let us say, the Sharia law gets into the statute book and no one challenges it on the ground of federal state division of power, I will be coming to uh, one way in which Sharia law can be passed. Even if that is so, there may be a problem of Article 8, equality before the law. If the Hudu law is applied only to Muslims, uh, let us say a Muslim thief has his hand amputated and his partner was a non-Muslim who is only given a few years imprisonment. So two thieves working together, one gets amputation, one gets uh, imprisonment. I think there will be problems of Article 8, equality before the law. 
and equal protection of the law. Uh, to solve this problem of unequal treatment, the Hudud law could apply to all. If that is so, that will raise problems of Article 11, freedom of religion. You can't apply Hudud to non-Muslims. So, these problems are there. But how to overcome these hurdles? Possibly, one could overcome these hurdles. At least in Malaysia, I'm not recommending that Singapore should go down that lane, no. Uh, I'm saying in Malaysia, this is a real issue. So, we have to scratch our head to see how to overcome this problem. Um, can Sharia can Sharia be legislated? The answer is yes. In a limited way, already 22 topics exist uh, whereby Sharia is legislated by the state enactments. Uh, mostly family law, certain amount of criminal laws, um, not saying a prayer, uh, not fasting, etc. Uh, secondly, uh, power of federal parliament. Uh, this is something that uh, uh, has displeased many of my non-Muslim friends. Uh, nevertheless, um, I have to say, um, federal parliament actually has the power to enact uh, laws without calling them hudud laws, but adopting their spirit or their provisions. I'm just giving an example. Federal Parliament has the power over theft in the Penal Code, amend the Penal Code, and <laughs> don't call it hudud. <laughs> call it theft, call it uh, rape, call it uh, homosexuality. Uh, uh, federal Parliament can do so. Uh, it can amend the Banking and Financial Institutions Act to abolish riba in the public interest or on the grounds of morality, not because it is uh, against Islam. But if you use Islamic vocabulary, uh, then there will be Article 11 objection uh, applying Islam to non-Muslim. But in the public interest, by the way, um, Prof. Uh, Roscoe Pound uh, in his theories of jurisprudence, public interest, private interest, social interest, one of the social interests he says is that uh, interest, gambling, he said all this should be abolished. The state should regulate them. So, abolishing interest, abolishing gambling, uh, abolishing betting is not necessarily something outlandish. Uh, Roscoe Pound was a botanist, a great uh, writer of sociological jurisprudence uh, in the USA. So, I think federal parliament can do a lot of things um, giving effect to uh, the Sharia, giving effect to Hudud laws but not calling them such. But of course, whether it should or not, now that's a big policy issue. I remember Tan Sri Ahmad Ibrahim once told me this. He says, he said, we have a system of uh, uh, hakam. Uh, husband and wife uh, have problems, appoint one from here, one from there, a, a reconciler, uh, a negotiator, and uh, try to solve the problems. He says, we have put that into the non-Muslim Marriage and Divorce Act by calling him by another name. <laughs> so, under the Non-Muslim Marriage and Divorce Act, actually, uh, anytime a non-Muslim couple have a problem, they can't divorce right away. They must first go for conciliation. So, there is a conciliation board. So, Tansri's view was, this is Islamic law. But, so, that's the kind of thing federal parliament can do, uh, if it wishes to do. It can directly apply the, uh, parliament cannot directly apply the Sharia to non-Muslims, but it can do so indirectly. Uh, also, federal parliament has power to empower the states under Article 76A. In fact, this is something that may be coming up in this parliament. Parliament met, uh, I think, uh, 9th or 10th it met and there is rumor that uh, PAS, the Islamic party is going to um, seek permission under 76A. 76A of the federal constitution says that the federal parliament may under article 76A <coughs> delegate its legislative power on any matter to the states. So actually federal parliament could say to Kalantan, alright, on Matters of, they would have to specify on uh, such such matters of crime, 
the Kalantan Assembly is ever empowered to enact laws for Muslims. It could do so if it wishes. Whether it will do it or not, I don't know. Um, there are also rumors going around that uh, Amno is very eager to wean, pass away from uh, the Pakatan Raya. And one way would be to give in to the pass aspiration uh, to enact uh, Hudud and let pass enact the law in Kalantan. I think what many Muslims and Malays who don't necessarily support this view, what they are saying is this, if Kalantan does it, state after state will be under pressure. And I'm sure you are aware, um, surveys have been done uh, in KL um, of uh, young Muslims, educated Muslims, accountants, lawyers, doctors, uh, nearly 55% or so say they support the Sharia. Of course, much depends also on how you frame the question here. Uh, uh, if you frame the question here specifically to say, do you support chopping of hands? Or do you support stoning to death? Then maybe the answer may be different. Do you support uh, Hudu? Of course, the answer is yes. <laughs> because sometimes they don't even know what is the Hudu, of course. So I, I think um, these surveys are um, something that one should not rely too much on as reflecting um, public opinion. But the scholars are saying, look, survey has been done and it is quite uh, clear that uh, the pull, uh, the attraction of Islamic State, of the Hudud, is there in Malay minds, on Malay minds. So, Parliament could actually empower the states under 76A. Um, what if UMNO doesn't introduce a law to delegate power to uh, pass in Kalantan? Well, there is another way, there is a way um, to um, for PAS to initiate the matter. PAS could possibly introduce a private member's bill. A private member's bill is a bill introduced by um, a non-government person, a non-government MP. So it's not a government bill. It's a bill either by an opposition or by a by some private MP. So that's a private member's bill. Uh, they have to draft it, they have to submit it to the private bill office, uh, it has to go to the speaker. The speaker has virtually absolute discretion uh, to admit it or to turn it down. In 57 years, no private member's bill has ever passed the Malaysian parliament. Many have been introduced, no private member's bill has ever seen the light of the day. Nevertheless, this is always the first time. <laughs> so, a private member's bill could be drafted by PAS, introduced in Parliament with the Speaker's permission. Then, uh, the advantage of this would be, UMNO won't be blamed by its non-Muslim uh, partners, um, MCA, MIC, for introducing. UMNO will say, it's not ours, <laughs> it's, uh, it's PAS. So, that may be one way of doing it. Now, whether they'll do it or not, I don't know, that's politics. Um, nevertheless, legally, these are the ways. There are other problems about uh, the Sharia law in Malaysia. Uh, I'm sure um, all of you know that uh, um, there's no one Sharia law, one uniform law, like the way Singapore has. Um, uh, there are 14 separate Sharia laws, and there are conflicting approaches, and the problem of non-reciprocal enforcement. In some states like Negri Sembilan, Pada has very strong influence. In Kalantan, on the other hand, it's very, very conservative. Um, then there are, of course, political considerations. Uh, um, uh, the country has up to now been run by a multi-ethnic, multi-racial coalition. And I, I personally think Malaysia needs to have a multi-ethnic, multi-racial coalition. A, a, a one race or one religion government I don't think would be good for Malaysia and there is a real problem about Sabah Sarawak up to now Sabah Sarawak has been ignored uh, we have West Malaysians have taken Sabah Sarawak for granted 
but now there is assertiveness there. Sava Saravak is asserting itself, are asserting themselves. We must note that Sava Saravak have 25% of the seats in the Devan 25% in politics is a lot. They can make or break the government of the day. 56 out of 222 MPs belong to them. One must remember the experience of Sudan, the turmoil in Afghanistan, the turmoil in Pakistan. So I think that's the political consideration. Ethnic factors, though uh, uh, we don't talk about it, uh, the reality is that actually a large part of Islamic law, Islamic law in Malaysia is actually Islamic law plus Malayana. It is, though it's not normally acknowledged, it comes under the broad rubric of um, uh, Salangor Muslim law enactment, but actually many parts of it are not really Muslim law. They are, they are, they are, uh, they are other. Um, Negri Semilan is the most extreme example where actually the rules of uh, Farayad are displaced uh, by uh, Adat Parpati. There are of course economic considerations. Um, I'm not talking of family law, but uh, uh, if you abolish usury, stock market, speculative capital, casinos, liquor, manufacturing, drinking, tourism, pig farm. By the way, Malaysia has the biggest, largest number of pig farms in the whole of Southeast Asia. I live in Kuala Lumpur, I travel to Shah Alam every morning. Every morning I pass by Guinness Tark first and then Kalsburg. <laughs> <laughs> so, Malaysia is, uh, and, and I, personally speaking, I think that's one of the beauties uh, that we say multiracial. Life will become boring <laughs> if I didn't pass by Kalsburg. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, I think economy would be affected if you take a very rigid ideological stand. So we must be aware. Uh, there must be clear appreciation of the problems involved. Um, uh, economic implications of a sh totally Sharia compliant economic system. Rise of religious extremism. Um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Rahman and Rahim. He permits diversity and differences. However, uh, lately, um, things have not worked so well. I just very quickly jotted down something which is um, at, at your fingertips. But for me, of course, it's knowledge. I, I think the Holy Quran is a bridge between many shores. Uh, there's a duty to do justice, <coughs> not just to Muslims. Uh, the duty to do justice transcends race, religion, region, and personal relations. You have to do justice even against your own brother, against your own father. Islam's affinity with Judaism and Christianity is quite clear. Uh, so many surahs are jotted down here. Um, the prophets of Christianity and Judaism are held in great veneration. Um, uh, and of course, uh, uh, Surah 20, uh, 21, 46, we believe in that which has been revealed to us and revealed to you. And our God and your God is one and we are all Muslims in submission to Him. Um, the, the religions of Christianity and Judaism are held in great veneration. They come from a common fountain, divinely revealed. Um, there's a whole chapter in the Holy Quran um, about uh, called Maryam, uh, about the birth of Jesus Christ. Very poignant, beautiful passages about the story of uh, Christmas. So I, I think in Islam there is a tremendous affinity with Judaism and Christianity. There is religious pluralism. Let him who believe, let him who will believe, and let him who will disbelieve. There is no compulsion in religion. Lakum dinukum baliyadin. Cooperation and courtesy towards other religions is recommended. Do not argue with people of the scripture except in a way that is best. Insult not those who invoke other than Allah lest they insult you. There is respect for other places of worship. So I think the spirit of the Holy Quran is clearly one of respect for other religions, tolerance. Fanaticism is un Islamic. Asabiya is un Islamic. Vasatiya, moderation, is commended. Um, unfortunately, however, uh, lately we have had some problems uh, over the last 10 years or so where 
civil courts and Sharia courts, civil authorities and Sharia authorities are often in clash with each other. Um, um, for example, um, conversion of infants um, is often a problem. Sometimes the religious authorities go to orphanages and they will convert a child to Islam. I, I, I'm not so sure if the same thing happens conversion to other religions. I'm sorry, I do not know of such a case. But I know there are some highly publicized cases where parents gave up their children, um, non-Muslim parents gave up their children to the orphanage, um, or the child was taken away because of domestic abuse. The child was then converted to Islam. Later on, in, in later years, the father mother wants to claim the child, or the child wants to go back to his original religion. And we have problems. There have been cases where actually a child in an orphanage converted. When the child grew of age, the child wants to go back to his original religion because he says, I, I didn't know. I didn't know what happened. How did I get converted? Under the law, they cannot do so because the child must understand the Kalima Shahada. But it takes place. It takes place. Yeah? I see. Can you say that loud? No, in, tra in traditional Maliki jurisprudence, it is allowed to convert the child. Uh, in traditional Maliki jurisprudence, as far as I know. Maybe they are, I'm not so sure in Shafi, but, but in Maliki, but I it's allowed. But I think that's what is happening. Um, um, custody of infants is a problem. Um, as I mentioned to you earlier, um, one spouse converts converts the children to Islam. Um, the Attorney General Chamber, the police have been drawn into these disputes. Um, so these are very painful disputes, really. Uh, when you consider it from the point of view, of objectively, from the point of view of justice, a mother brought up her children, suddenly the child is taken away uh, and she's told custody belongs to the uh, husband and sometimes the husband was a fellow who during the subsistence of the marriage never took care of the child never provided maintenance but suddenly now suddenly now he is uh, the most loving father and he gets the uh, he gets the custody of the child apostasy by muslims has raised uh, a lot of controversies muslim women seeking injunction against domestic violence there was one case of a lady by the name of Farida, she went to the Sharia courts to seek, uh, sorry, she went to the civil court to seek injunction against her husband for domestic violence. The husband side said, no, 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 you can't go to the civil court. This is a Sharia matter. Why is it a Sharia matter? Because uh, a man is allowed to beat his wife. <laughs> so it's a Sharia matter. And the civil court withdrew from the case. The matter went to the Sharia court and the Sharia court delay, 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 delay. I, 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 I don't know why the reason for the delay, but evidently the cases were delayed. She didn't obtain her injunction from the uh, Sharia court. Sharia courts do have the power to issue injunctions. She didn't get one. So postponement, postponement. At the next postponement, she went to the Sharia court and said, thank you, no need. I'm not a Muslim anymore. She opted out of the religion. Uh, with that, she was immediately arrested and sentenced to jail for insulting Islam. So we have had some such problems and they, they bring a bad name both to the courts and to the religion. And, and of course, there is the issue of uh, people seeking justice or justice being delayed. A seizure of Bibles, I'm um, sorry to mention this, um, in Salangor, there has been a lot of assertiveness on the part of Jais and Mice. They have been raiding churches, uh, seizing Bibles. They have been raiding temples, uh, arresting uh, girls uh, who they suspect actually was a Muslim, born a Muslim, but had converted illegally um, to uh, Hinduism. Uh, there is ban on the use of the term Allah and about that he fought for other words. Uh, and now, in the <coughs> context of West Malaysia, 
perhaps this is not such a serious problem, use of the word Allah by Christian, but in the context of Saba Sarawa, it is a real problem. Saba Sarawakians were using the word Allah for a long, long time, even before they joined. I apologize, those of you who may have roots in Saba Sarawa, uh, some Saba Sarawakians say, we didn't join Malaysia, we constituted Malaysia. Yes, <laughs> I confess, I confess to that. So Savasravikans have a problem. They have been using Indonesian Bibles uh, and uh, um, they use the word Allah. Uh, uh, so many of us are recommending, okay, in Savasrava, they should be allowed to use whatever they have been using um, for decades. In the case of West Malaysia, let's have a compromise. The problem there is this. Some Savasravikans say, hello. I travel often to KL. What do you want me to do? At the immigration checkpoint, leave my Bible behind. And I don't know how to answer that question. So it's, a, it's an intractable, it's a really unsolvable problem. Uh, how, how you view it, I, I have my own personal views. Uh, maybe during question. Electronic version of Bible. Seriously. Yeah. We'll, we'll prosecute you electronically. <laughs> Electric, I'm sure electric. I'm sure electric. That's a good one. This body snatching. Oh, in several cases of body snatching, a person dies. There's a grieving family. Uh, suddenly, someone reports that actually the person was a Muslim. He had converted. And in fact, the famous mountaineer who had climbed Mount Everest, the first Malaysian to climb Mount Everest. He was an army uh, junior officer. Uh, he, for all we know, his name was Hindu. He used to go to um, Batu caves and all. But then he died. Someone says, no, 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 he had converted to Islam. So his body was seized. They brought the FRU, Federal Reserve Unit. Federal Reserve Unit was summoned actually to seize his body. Uh, to take it for a Muslim burial. There have been a few other cases. So these are sad cases and uh, they bring to the religion a bad name, they bring to the Sharia authorities a bad name, they, they tear our social fabric apart and we need to resolve these issues. However, civil courts do assert themselves now and then. Uh, and this afternoon I was mentioning um, on the issue of whether a non-Muslim marriage can be dissolved by the Sharia court. The civil courts have said, no, uh, Sharia court ruling is not binding. There have been a few other cases where the <coughs> civil courts have asserted themselves. Um, so there is sadly a negative perception of the quality of justice in the Sharia courts. I emphasize uh, that this is a matter of perception. Um, um, perception may not be uh, right. I personally have been to Sharia court. I think the quality of Justice in the Sharia courts is no lesser than the quality of justice in the civil courts. Civil courts are no uh, great citadels of justice either. But nevertheless, uh, uh, Sharia court has to be of a higher standard. Um, uh, there have been a string of Sharia court decisions against non-Muslim women like M. Indra Gandhi, especially in custody cases, conversion cases. And it has left the sad impression that non-Muslims cannot expect any justice in the Muslim courts. Uh, actually, a totally alternative view and vision of Islam is entirely possible, um, entirely possible, and uh, uh, we need to work on that. I, I think what is needed is inspiring Islamic leadership, um, Muslim leaders, uh, Muslim leaders uh, who would be able to walk the middle path, a path of asatiya, uh, a path of justice, to be able to take note of um, the suffering of everyone. Uh, at the moment, uh, we are sadly lacking uh, such leaders. Um, uh, for example, uh, just a few months ago, I, I know this personally because the lawyer happens to be my former student. Um, Kasim Ahmed, 81 year old, was uh, taken to court. Uh, at 9.30 at night, they raided his house. The lawyer's brief to the court says, 
So I, I have to rely on the lawyer's brief. The lawyer's brief says 13 cars went to his house <laughs> to apprehend him. He's not a terrorist. He's not strapped with uh, bombs. 13 cars went to his house at 9.30 at night and they uh, brought him over to KL because this is the Vilaya authorities, not the Kada authorities. He, 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 they arrested him in Kada. So they went at night to his house, they brought him to KL. Um, the last mass flight had left, so they took a, uh, uh, the, uh, the airlines they took um, and reached KL 11.30 or so. They interrogated him and they asked him to post bail. But they said the bail must be in cash. It cannot be in terms of surety. And they said the bail must be posted by someone from Kada, cannot be from KL. How do you at 1.30 at night in KL get someone from Kada to post bail for you? So he stayed in detention till next afternoon when someone from Kada uh, came over with the money. So th this kind of behavior, is, uh, of course, whether he is guilty of uh, uh, being a murtad or he has committed uh, blasphemy, I think that's a matter for the experts to decide. But it did appear to me that an 81-year-old Muslim scholar uh, is taken to court in this manner. That doesn't look right. Uh, a former mufti, uh, uh, mufti, former mufti of uh, Perlis was prosecuted because he was giving a charama without a tawliya from the uh, Selangor uh, authorities. Uh, often they immerse themselves in trivial issues and uh, uh, they want to ban yoga because yoga is an Islamic. There may be elements of it that may be an Islamic, but actually just because you stretch your muscles or you meditate, uh, I don't see what is so un-Islamic about it. I I've tried yoga myself, but I stopped. Every time I try yoga, I fall asleep. <laughs> it produces so much meditation that I don't last. <laughs> but I, I don't, I don't, I don't say Om Om Satnarayan. I can easily say Allah Muhammad. <laughs> so I, I don't know. But these are the issues. They are so so troubled about, uh, um, and I, all the time, all the time. I'm sure there are some very good scholars there uh, and uh, men of God, uh, but uh, the, the publicity that comes with this type of issues, uh, uh, it's very sad. Uh, uh, they are going after transvestites. Uh, I'm not supporting the transvestites, but surely uh, what's more important, taking care of the widows, the orphans, the needy, uh, the sick, the aged, um, or uh, spending all your time chasing after transvestite. Um, there is a growing list of people and things from the Jews to the Shias, Ismailis, Qadianis, revisionists, deviationists, liberals, pluralists. Um, we, we have to hate them. So I sometimes wonder, how does hating anything and everything make me a happier and a better Muslim? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, but that's what is happening now, actually. Uh, it's, it's a recent phenomenon. There are, of course, international considerations uh, about uh, um, Islam is under deep but unjustified suspicion. Um, I think you said it so well that the whole word Sharia arouses a whole range of emotions. So, uh, I, I think it is unjustified suspicion in the Western world as the greatest threat to world peace. I've done some work on that. A large number of the atrocities committed by Muslims are actually being committed because of provocation and support by Western nations. Um, whether it is the Taliban or it is the IS, they are actually creatures created by Western money, Western military. Um, I mean, the IS guys uh, are having tanks. They are having... Uh, uh, missiles uh, which shoot down planes. Who is supplying it to them? Obviously someone is supplying it to them. That's why they have this. So, uh, I, I fully agree that it's unjustified suspicion. Um, there is false association between Islam and terrorism. 
the Western perception is, that might depend on how you define terrorism. Every uh, drone attack is terrorism. But nobody says that America is the largest terrorist, biggest terrorist nation on earth. <coughs> Uh, I, I think what they did in Iraq, what they are doing in Afghanistan, what they are doing in Pakistan, in Sudan, in Somalia, is terrorism. But, of course, it's a matter of uh, who has control over the media. Uh, so, I, I, I think at this, at this time, um, when Islam is under severe attack, uh, to talk in terms of an Islamic state, in terms of Hudud, uh, may not be uh, entirely uh, wise, uh, may not be wise, I think this is the wrong time. I, I don't think we should, we should measure the depth of the sea at low tide. If you measure the depth of the sea at low tide, you don't get a good reading. <laughs> and at this particular moment with IS beheading people, if the beheadings are true, I don't know. I, I don't know. Um, I don't want to be uh, overly skeptical, but there are friends of mine who have said, I, I show this is not a, a, a doctored video. For example, the, uh, what was, it, was it the Egyptians uh, fellow who was burnt alive? Jordanian. Jordanian. Is it Jordanian burnt alive? Uh, many of my colleagues said, eh, have you seen him on fire? I said, well, I, I didn't see the, him on fire. I saw the fire approaching him. Uh, that's all that I saw. So many of them are saying that a lot of these videos are not. But in the official magazine data, the, the, uh, the ISIS have claimed responsibility and explained why. Yeah, Now, yes. All right, so um, what are the alternatives? I'll just go to that. That's the last point, sir. What are the alternatives? Uh, for Malaysia. Uh, Muslims in Malaysia stand at the crossroads. What are our choices? Number one is the 1957 uh, Merdeka Constitution um, uh, that offered an approach, a mixed, a hybrid, a plural setup. Ideological purity was avoided. Pragmatism prevailed. This is what happened from 57 to 1980 or so. Uh, no, no emphasis on ideological purity. You do what is right, you do what is necessary, and you walk the middle path. Number two is Islamization, but not an Islamic state. That was the practice of the Mahathiri years, 1980 onwards. Uh, economy, education, um, administration would have Islamic elements. I must confess, large part of what happened during um, that time was symbolic. There was a lot of emphasis on begin, beginning every meeting with the uh, prayer, uh, dress, uh, mostly symbolic, but issues of good politics, corruption, um, they were not tackled. Nevertheless, that's the second approach, Islamization, but not an Islamic state. A third uh, and that's the last slide, sir. A third approach is one country, two systems. Leave the non-Muslims alone. Don't subject them to Islam because they won't like that. They will object. There will be international hue and cry. Have a country, one country, two systems. Um, Muslims governed by Islamic law in all fields. Contract, tort, commerce, banking, everything. Muslims, you and I, must go under Sharia courts. Uh, Non-Muslims will go under civil courts. So, uh, one country, two systems. Now, this will be extremely complex in commercial law because more often than not, one party may be a non-Muslim, one party will be a Muslim. Also, how do you determine the religion of a company? <laughs> a company, legally speaking, is a entity distinct from uh, its members. So, how, how do you determine? Even in family law cases, it's quite obvious uh, there are conflict of laws when one party converts. Number four, a full-fledged Islamic state like Saudi Arabia, Iran, Afghanistan. I, I hope you'll forgive me. Uh, I, I'm implying that they are Islamic. Saudi Arabia, Iran, Afghanistan. I've heard people say, oh, come on. Saudi Arabia is the last country on earth for which I will use the word Islamic. <laughs> so, I, I seek your forgiveness. 
I'm just making a generalization that a full-fledged Islamic state um, uh, like these, this will require significant changes to the present constitutional and legal setup. Um, the Malaysian constitution does not at the moment support a full-fledged Islamic state. You have to rewrite it. Now, whether it should be done or not um, is uh, a political decision ultimately. Uh, um, however, there will be hurdles because to change some of the fundamental provisions of the constitution will require a consent, two-third majority in the two houses, the one right, the one Negara, the consent of the young Dikpratonagong, plus the consent of the Majlis Raja Raja, the conference of rulers, and the consent of the young Dikpratwa Negiri Sabasara. This will not be easy. So, um, the task is very large, challenges are great, uh, but of course, uh, it's a political decision uh, whether this is to be done or not. Thank you very much. Thank you for your patience. I'm sure you'll you will share with me the, the, the complexity and the difficulty of the topic. Uh, it's really between whether we are talking about Sharia or whether we are talking about fair, whether we are talking about law or often we are talking about politics more than anything else. Yes. Uh, like what uh, Shafiq has mentioned earlier. So before we invite uh, uh, your comments and that we join these questions, uh, allow me to invite Dr. Mohamed Musa. He has uh, done a bit of uh, research uh, on matters related to this. So probably he, he wants to share a bit of the research in this form. So, um, I think in five minutes, uh, I just want to, like to share um, with you a few, few developments uh, regarding the United Nations uh, human rights that related to uh, Majlis Agama Islam, Jabatan Agama Islam in Malaysia. Uh, in 2014, Haider Belasir, a special rapporteur for freedom of religion, UN official, has reprimanded Malaysia several times on the issue of the use of the word Omba by Christians. In a media statement, Haider Belasir, as an official of the United Nations Organization, declared that religious freedom is the right of every human being and not to be determined by the government. Therefore, the government has no right to shape, define, or impose one authority in interpreting religious sources, including the definition involving religious teachings. But also, another important uh, development that uh, not reported online. For the first time, the, dis the discrimination against Shia community in Malaysia is brought into attention. The special rapporteur sent a formal request to understand the human rights violations to what is known as the formal communication to Malaysian government. Three cases have been raised in the formal communication. First, the incidents involving the arrest of more than 100 Shia adherents in Perak. Second, the incident where a Shia religious teacher was arrested during a religious ceremony on April 21, 2014. Thirdly, the ban on a novel alleged to, to be spreading Shia propaganda on April 9, 2014. It's my fault, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and um, this um, uh, formal communications. Uh, being uh, rich to Malaysian government uh, due to rubber plan of action. I would like to just brief a little bit about rubber plan of action. Rubber plan of action um, is uh, designed to be a practical step using legislation, jurisprudence and executive policies to achieve the implementation of Article 20 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Uh, I do believe Singapore did ratify ICCPR, but I'm, but no? No? Okay, no. But Malaysia obviously uh, uh, does not ratify uh, ICCPR. Article 20 says any propaganda for war shall be prohibited by law. Second, any advocacy of national, racial, or religious hatred that constitutes incitement to discrimination, hostility, or violence shall be prohibited by law. Let me uh, uh, details a little bit on the Rabat Plan of Action. 
Rubber Brand of Action also provides guidelines and policies for government and civil society in preventing collective religious hatred. As a plan, it is also described as it's not reasonably be considered as freedom of expression and can be regarded as collective religious hatred. The guide describes collective religious hatred as involving six, six, six points, six factors. First, context. For example, just by doing an in-depth analysis of the context of speech alone, its social and political background can be determined and whether it is directed at target groups such, such as Christians, or Shias, or Amadis. Second, speaker. Position of the individual expressing the hate speech is as entitled to be identified, in particular whether the individual speakers represent any other religious groups or what his status in society is. Third, intent. In this case, intention and not negligence or recklessness should be, be given focus. In other words, seditious elements and active invitation can be determined by the relationship between object and subject of the speech and the public. If it is done on the basis of negligence or ignorance, then it cannot be argued as a collective religious hatred. Fourth, content of form. Analysis of the content and form of speech is also very critical in determining if it is, in fact, a violation of human rights. The content of speech should be determined whether it smells of provocation, whether it is direct, and whether the arguments are thorough or not. Fifth, extent of the speech. Meanwhile, the extent of speech is also emphasized in this context whether the speech is done in public and also the size of the audience, whether it is small or large. The means of dissemination, whether the speech was disseminated through one single leaflet or through broadcasting in the mainstream media or internet. Also, the statement or publication was widely accessible to the general public. Um, last one, potential risk. Finally, incitement and determinations cultivating quality religious hatred is determined based on the potential risk that may occur because of the speech or broadcast involved. In this case, the hate speech is usually direct and indeed meant to cause damage to the target group. Um, since we are in a close meeting, um, I was told that uh, Shia groups and the uh, Christian group uh, has worked together uh, to do another report, Special Report of the United Nations uh, Organization, and they are complaining that uh, how Friday sermon in Malaysia became become vehicle of human rights violation in the name of Islamic revivalism. So there are um, few examples that actually uh, I've written uh, how um, freedom uh, Friday sermons have been has been used as a vehicle or tool to, to stigmatize uh, minorities, um, uh, especially uh, the Christians and uh, uh, the, the Shias. Um, yeah, that it will be my <laughs> part of contribution. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, um, we've got on the table legal practitioners, law professors, social activists, observants like, me, like myself. And religious teachers, I'm sure they will come with uh, various multi perspectives to the issues that we have uh, put forward here. So, can I now invite uh, responses, comments from members of the floor, um, or questions if you wish to, um, to ask our question, Shah, or for the matter of the uh, puzzle? Yes. Yes, uh, our colleague. Thank you. Chef, thank you uh, so much for your presentation. Um, I'd like you, I'm, I'm uh, a lawyer, so perhaps I should ask a legal question, but I want to get away from the law. Please do. I think even for the lawyers, that's where it gets more interesting. Um, and the question that I had really, is not so much about national or party politics, but is a question about um, what are the discourses happening within or amongst the Muslims in Malaysia. Um, you know, you had talked about, particularly at the end of your remarks, uh, different as provisions that might, uh, different visions of Islam, different interpretations of Islam. Uh, some that might be uh, uh, more pluralistic, others that might be uh, uh, less tolerant of those who have a different point of view. <clears throat> and since so much of this is, you know, others, um, as I'm sure you are aware, others have, in fact, exacerbated this, or put it in stronger terms. They've even talked about a war within Islam sometimes for <clears throat> But I'm interested to know what the discourses are within the uh, Muslim community or communities in Malaysia. 
I'm sure like other societies, uh, Malaysia too is uh, rich in discourse. If you, if you look at the internet, clearly there is a rich um, discourse. Uh, the main problem that we are facing that may distinguish us from other societies is that some types of discourse don't get public airing and others do. So in general at this particular moment the conservative discourse has official backing on TV, on radio, uh, you have these uh, very conservative ideas being expressed, uh, Friday sermons, a lot of uh, what I would say is obscurantist uh, <laughs> interpretation of Islam even uh, prominence uh, speeches by the young Nipratonagong, by the Sultan, by the Prime Minister sometimes um, make me um, absolutely horrified for example some time ago Prime Minister Najib talked about the evils of liberalism and pluralism. I was telling myself which madman wrote his speech. <laughs> I mean, to say that Islam doesn't support pluralism, much of course depends on how you interpret or misinterpret the word, but uh, uh, surely in Islam there is recognition of other religions. Uh, uh, so, there is a large section of the Muslim community that doesn't agree with what's going on. How large it is, I really won't be able to tell. Is it 50% or is it 25%? Uh, but what I can say is this, that uh, if leadership were available, a lot more people will speak out and speak up against a predominantly conservative, obscurantist, intolerant, narrow uh, point of view and a point of view that tends to emphasize or overemphasize trivial issues. Like what I was saying, uh, saying that uh, yoga is haram. Um, Now, of course, the tirade against the Shias. These are not majority views. I don't think so. I work in a predominantly Malay environment. My university has 180,000 students, <laughs> 20,000 staff, 10 plus 10. We have 35 campuses. And uh, um, it happens very often. In the classroom, they will say expected things, traditional things. After the class, they'll come and say, Prof, actually, I didn't mean it that way. <laughs> so, why didn't you say so? <laughs> so, I think there is a, a lot of dissatisfaction with the, a, the religious authorities. And I, I have to say this. Unlike some other countries, unlike Singapore, unlike other countries, um, in Malaysia the system of appointment of mufti and all is very political. These are not necessarily s scholars, uh, authors of books. No, these are politicians. One particular mufti was a former special branch officer. <laughs> yes. And... Uh, so they, they say the things that are popular, but not necessarily learned. For example, the Allah issue uh, has been really played up. And scholar after scholar uh, who says that, uh, hey, we should go slow on this. What's wrong? What's wrong with it? Uh, the word Allah, et etymologically speaking, is a word of language, much older. 
or they are they are dismissed as uh, being murtad. I think the problem is this: uh, most Muslims who are liberal, and I'm using the word liberal not in the sense of supporting homosexuality and prostitution and same sex, no? they say tolerant, open-minded. Uh, most Muslims of this sort are quiet. So I think there is uh, a fair variety of opinions, but uh, the impression one would get is that it's all conservative. That's the impression one would get because the official media is like that. But if you read the uh, media, alternative media, and then of course one gets a different picture. Also I have to say this to you sir, uh, I, I, don't, I, I hope I can say it politely. There's a lot of Muslim hating on the web. By whom I'm not so sure because on the web now people can give any name they like. But uh, uh, Malaysia has become deeply polarized. And a large number of my friends and colleagues who are human rights advocates, who are lawyers and uh, otherwise wonderful people, when it comes to the evaluation of Islam, they tend to be extremely unsympathetic. So, I'll I just give you one example to illustrate. I was invited to a September 11 uh, seminar to commemorate. And, and of course, I condemn it as a act of great uh, atrocity, very heinous. But I did ask my president of the Bar Council, I said, I thank you for inviting me. I'm just wondering, why the Bar Council never organized a commemoration of Sabra or Shatila <laughs> or of uh, some of the other theatres of great atrocity. So somehow Muslim suffering is something that is not the concern of a large number of non-Muslims, many of whom are actually wonderful people, human rights advocates, but Muslim suffering is not a problem. Uh, nobody talks about what is happening in Afghanistan or in Iraq or the, the, the absolutely unfair treatment that Iran is getting from the world community. I mean, at least on the issue of uh, uh, sanctions against Iran. What has Iran done to justify that? Uh, and uh, Iran is a signatory to the international treaty. Iran has a right to manufacture uh, energy uh, for peaceful purposes. <coughs> the way Libya was treated, Syria has been treated, there's no concern. So I think uh, the discourse is very polarized in Malaysia, very polarized. Uh, I don't know how it could be put on an even keel. Leadership is needed. Uh, there is some positive development, I think about three or four months ago, 25 Malays the newspapers call them 25 em eminent Malays, retired diplomats, etc. They, they wrote in the paper saying, we are not pleased with the way Islamic discourse is uh, proceeding in this country. But they were vilified. They were vilified. All 25 were vilified, especially the leader who happens to be a woman, Farida, mm. a former diplomat to Geneva. So they vilified her that she is this, she is this. She doesn't wear a tudong. So that became the criterion of judging a good Muslim. Uh, that's the criterion. She doesn't wear a tudong. So she's not a good Muslim. Um, so I really am not in a position to uh, say, and I totally agree with you, there is war within Islam. There is in the sense that within Muslim there is deep, deep disagreement. But so in Malaysia at the moment, Muslims who are Tolerant, they are large in numbers, but they won't speak out. They won't speak out. For example, uh, Marina Mahathir is in a group uh, with this. She she's in this 25. She gave a public statement saying, "I hope my father will support us." He did not. <laughs> he did not. I'm sure he done in his heart. He's he's with them. He, he would not, because politically that would not be 
would not be safe for them. She said, I hope my, my dad, my dad will support us on this issue. He kept quiet. Uh, we'll take in a couple of questions at one, at one time so that we can see some time. see in one. And what is the anyone else? Uh, okay, Al-Khair uh, and also Al-Khair and Al-Khair and Let's take these three questions together and then probably talk about each other. Thank you, Bob. Um, very interesting you mentioned that if you, someone were to read mainstream media in Malaysia, one would think that Malaysian society is so conservative. Whereas you were right, online there's a lot of resistance and uh, uh, protestations. Yes, a very different picture of Malaysia is because of Islam. I'm reflecting that in Singapore, it's probably the other way around. <laughs> One reads uh, mainstream media thinks that the Muslim community is so open and, and tolerant and liberal in public. Whereas online media seems to paint a different picture that we are like, so conservative especially the discourse on Islam in uh, online platforms of the local Muslim community here. So I think a lot has got to do with the political structures in place. And people are using different platforms as an act of resistance, whether pro or against establishment. Uh, so perhaps the political factor is quite an important element in, in, in both societies. In Malaysia, I see possibly a conflation between the Islamist politics that has been in emergence and ascendancy since the 1980s, which you mentioned, plus conservative politics uh, of authoritarian nature. Uh, and that has came out uh, since, particularly since 2008. Uh, I'm not sure if you can give your opinions on this, that a lot of these vigilante groups that we are seeing, like the Kassa and, and even the ISMA become more vocal after seemingly after 2008 when AMNO lost, uh, uh, BN lost two-third majority in parliament and it somehow opened the, the, the floodgate to a lot of issues pertaining to inter-religious tensions, pertaining to uh, she is against Shiism. Of course it has been happening but we see it more and more coming up after 2008. So you were mentioning that uh, it's a lack of political will but I'm questioning is it also part of the political play uh, in order to split the Pakatan, uh, especially of the alliance of DAP, PAS and PKR, where it's clear that playing up of the Shiism issue within PAS, it's, it's to split PAS internally, especially when we see Mat Sabu being pigeon as a Shia supporter, etc. And then Hudud issue being played up against, uh, you know, to, to create tensions between, uh, even between PAS, between those who are professionals against the ulama class and between AP and, and PAS or PKR whose base support is more of the cosmopolitan in the urban base so the issues of liberalism uh, which was uh, the, the hallmark of Anwar Ibrahim's discourse became a, an issue so I, I, I'm seeing 2008 the loss of two third majority as crucial because AMNO wants to win over the Malay votes at all costs and therefore playing up religious, racial tensions and issues become quite crucial. So do you think that, that is, 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 there is basis in, in that kind of analysis in your opinion? Apart from the ascendancy of the 1980s Islamist politics. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, it's okay. Uh, uh, what you mentioned in your, in your talk just now about how the people in power, the, the political power should do in clearing the matter or issue between civil court and Sharia court. My question is, the ulama themselves, the ulama, uh, if we have a discussion on looking at the Sharia law, that is uh, to look at the other, uh, uh, not just Nazam Shafi, for example, who probably doesn't suit the uh, Malaysian current context, uh, to say that uh, not just to, to, to implement Mazhab Shafi, but rather as a Mazhab which should or uh, can um, suit the context of, of Malaysia. Seeing that this is a Sharia court, not Shafi court, for example. Uh, question. Uh, when we talk about the things that the Sharia court, uh, the Sharia court and the uh, you, uh, you should all those uh, issues work. And even the fatwa of yoga, 
I mean, that, that was based on a paper written by my um, vice dean in UK back then. <laughs> it was in 2008. Uh, perhaps, apart from all the challenges that you have uh, shared with us today, perhaps one of the other challenges that, that uh, Malaysia is facing now is in fact the lack of ethics in, uh, in the implementation of Sharia law itself. If you have to look at all the uh, fatwas and all the rulings made by the Sharia, uh, by the Sharia court, you will see that it is not uh, it is not wrong in the uh, in the uh, religious per se. In, in, in the rulings itself is not wrong. But perhaps the lack uh, the lack of ethics, the lack of understanding of uh, of the underlying reasons behind it is what is making the people themselves against what uh, what uh, what they are trying to do. I mean the uh, the effort the, the effort has been put too much to introduce this Islamic law <coughs> to make uh, to make Malaysia to an Islamic state. Itself is pushing the people away from that idea. I mean you you said that fifty five percent of the uh, young professionals in KL are for good. But the question is that why are there still forty five percent of them against it? Looking at it yeah. the other way around. Yeah. Thank you. But this is exactly what uh, we mentioned earlier. Uh, the discourse can take a political uh, discourse, like uh, what uh, what Ibrahim was saying, or is it a matter of fair? And what Sir Walker was saying, uh, so plural and diverse in the fair. And we didn't even one particular matter, matter for that the matter is so rich, so diverse, so which particular views, uh, and then the issue of ethics. Um, you should be writing on Malaysian papers because your analysis <laughs> is brilliant. <laughs> they will not get an impression on the show. <laughs> social media. No? What the social media? Social media. No, I, I'm all with you on this issue that uh, there's a lot of politics behind all this. I'm no in the early decades was a moderating influence. Uh, PAS was the one that was constantly uh, uh, pushing the limits farther and farther to the right. Um, now what has happened actually is this, that uh, UMNO is what PAS was five years ago. And then PAS moves further right Amno tries to keep up. Amno doesn't understand that it can't outdo pass. It doesn't understand that. Because the credentials of pass are better on the issue of Islam. Amno doesn't have good Islamic credentials. They may have good credentials in terms of ethnicity maybe, but not on Islam. But yet that's what they are doing. They want to imitate pass, to pull the rug from under their feet. Mahathir said that. He says, Pass wants an Islamic state, we are already an Islamic state. So, and he gave examples of how much money is spent in uh, uh, setting up uh, this Sharia fund, this Sharia fund, etc. Uh, also, Amno is trying very hard, as you said, to win pass over, win over pass, wean them away from uh, uh, the opposition. And this Hudud thing actually is. Uh, one of the ways I'm sure you are aware the present push for the Hudud came not from PAS but from Amno Amno Cho Cho PAS in parliament <laughs> if you raise the issue we will give you support so PAS had no choice but to raise the issue uh, this present one actually is the Amma minister who raised the issue in parliament, uh, urging pass to raise the issue. So that I agree with you. The attempt is to win over pass, and if, if pass comes over, um, pass may be winning amongst the Malays. One vote for Amno, I understand there's one vote for pass. At one time it used to be that pass used to get about 20%, 25% Malay vote. I'm told that in 
208 and 213, it was one to one. Um, but of course, these are just uh, analysis that may not be correct. Nevertheless, so I think they have to win over pass. And uh, second effort, as you correctly pointed out, is actually that within pass itself, uh, uh, they want to wean away. Uh, sorry, they want to defeat within pass those people who are seen as sympathetic to Anwar. There is this faction within past that is very close to Anwar. And there is a faction that is uh, uh, more unknown. <laughs> uh, uh, so, Matsabu happens to be in the wrong faction, <laughs> in the faction that is supposedly uh, on the side of uh, Anwar. So that's why uh, Matsabu, and Matsabu is accused of being a Shia, of course. Uh, raising tensions. I think that's an old strategy. Um, Sometimes leaders go to war because one thing war does is uh, it unites the people under the common flag. So um, these te tensions are being raised. Uh, groups like uh, Parkasa, Isma, and others uh, are actually constantly raising issues uh, which need not be raised. On the other hand, I have to also point out. The Chinese media, in the vernacular language, also is quite uh, rabidly racist. Uh, it works both ways, actually. Uh, just like Utusan really goes all out. Uh, what else do the Chinese want? Uh, that was one of the headings, actually. Uh, I'm afraid the uh, Chinese papers are also uh, quite, uh, quite strong in their condemnation of Islam. And condemnation of the country. So I totally agree with you. This polarization is a game. Uh, they are hoping that with this polarization, Malays will unite behind them. Uh, Amno needs to win back the Malay vote because, uh, as Najib said at the end of the 2013 election, he said, uh, We suffered a Chinese tsunami. So because of the Chinese tsunami now, he's got to have a a Malay tide in his favor, and I think that's what he's trying to do. But he may not be right in his assessment because a lot of people uh, uh, may side with all these issues, with the government stand on some of these issues, but uh, they may not be entirely convinced. Uh, or rather, they may be seen through the game. They may be seen through the game. The Malay electorate is now not what it was in 1959. Uh, I think the Malay electorate, the young Malay students, I think they, are, they, they see through the game. So it will be interesting actually at the next election uh, what happens. Then I come to the issue, sir, of uh, you know, whether uh, Ulema could uh, uh, enrich Islam by looking at uh, any other mazhabs. I totally agree with you. Islam is a mansion with many, many rooms. The problem in Malaysia is that some of us Muslim leaders are in the basement. They are living in the basement. They don't see, they, they have no windows. There are windows there, then you see a little bit outside. They are living in the basement, and in the basement, the, the view is not so good. <laughs> so, uh, I think that's what should be, uh, again to quote Professor Tansri Ahmed Ibrahim in his book on Islamic law. He says we should build a garland of flowers from many gardens. Uh, I think uh, uh, a lot of scope for uh, learning from each other, uh, and not only from the Sunni school, but even from the Shias, uh, so that we can actually uh, achieve the same achieve the, the aims, aims of justice. Uh, what's the actual picture in Malaysia? In some state enactments, it says very clearly, the law on this point shall be the Shafi school of Islam and Malay Adar. In other enactments, it says the law on this point shall be the Bukum Shara. So they are, they are broader. In the courts, however, uh, and now a lot of young Malay lawyers trained at International Islamic University are now uh, 
arguing cases. Uh, gone are the, those days where actually uh, people went to the Sharia courts uh, without formal qualification. Some of, them, some of the Sharia judges didn't have formal qualification, but now I think some professionalism uh, has come in. I think many of them are arguing in terms of the various mazhabs. And as far as I know, the courts are receptive. The Sharia courts are receptive. Uh, but one problem we really have, I myself don't contemplate it, within each state, there are several centers of Sharia leadership. There's no one leadership within a state. Uh, there is an Islamic Religious Affairs Council, there is a Fatwa Council, there are, it's fairly chaotic actually, and they don't see eye to eye with each other. They have petty differences, they try to put each other down. Uh, of course the Sultan can play a unifying role, but uh, I don't know how it worked out that within each state, there is definitely more than one Sharia authority issuing fatwas or issuing statements about what Islamic law is. So I think that's what we need to do is uh, to treat diversity as, a, as an asset rather than uh, as a defect in, in Islam, this diversity. Um, your question about lack of ethics in the implementation of Sharia, well I, I think all law suffers from this problem, uh, uh, whether it is civil law or civil law, secular law, constitutional law, criminal law, a certain amount of lack of ethics, for example, in unequal enforcement. Um, for example, uh, our Sharia officers uh, prosecute people for khalwat. But it's always khalwat in cheap, cheap, small hotel. And never khalwat <laughs> in the Regent or in Hilton. In Hilton, they always go to read the, read the, read the holy books, I'm sure. <laughs> so there is, there is a economic bias there. Uh, uh, I was, I was uh, uh, in a joke, someone was advising me, if you want to be naughty in Shah Alam, uh, go to such and such hotel. I said, why this hotel? Oh, because this hotel is owned by the royalty. No Sharia officers are going to protect me. <laughs> so, okay, why didn't you tell me earlier? <laughs> <laughs> it's a little bit too late. <laughs> but no, no, it's not too late for us. <laughs> <laughs> So I, yes, I think that's an issue, unequal enforcement uh, of the law um, when it comes to uh, uh, the funds of the Sharia authorities. I don't know if there's an audit. Certainly the Auditor General never makes any noise. He makes noise about army and the police and about universities. He makes a noise about a lot of other things. I don't know if, if he ever makes a noise. I have never read any noise made about uh, uh, Sharia authorities. And I know that sometimes the Sharia authorities use their funds, zakat, fitra, uh, that they receive for purposes that I, I don't think they should use. I, I was, for example, asked for advice uh, about uh, Islamic University, new Islamic University to be set up. So I said, we already have uh, Islamic University, costs a lot of money. No, no, no problem, we are going to use uh, Baitul Mal. Mm -hmm. I said, but why should Baitul Mal be used to pay the salaries of professors? I, okay, you can use Baitul Mal for Islamic education, but to set up a university entirely for Baitul Mal, I, I think that's not fair. I think Baitul Mal should be used for uh, better purposes. So I think that's also an issue of uh, ethics. And to me, uh, another big issue of ethics is uh, no sense of priority. There are poor Muslims, there are widows, there are orphans, there are needy, and uh, we don't seem to be very concerned. I, I, I hope this is not an unfortunate example. I wish there were more Mother Teresas in the Muslim community could go out and you know take care of people who were despondent uh, where you don't judge you and uh, that the Christian belief that you condemn the sin but you love the sinner <laughs> I, I wish we could do that too people who are 
suffering from AIDS. Yes, I think we should have them. Should not be judging them. Uh, on the other hand, we had one Mufti who said uh, all AIDS sufferers should be sent to an island off the East Coast. He said that. Uh, so, uh, yes, I think there are problems of lack of ethics in the implementation of the Sharia. Um, but, uh, as I said earlier, I, I really don't think the standard of our Sharia courts in Malaysia is any lower than the standards of the, of the civil courts. Civil courts at the highest level, um, there are lots of doubts about their integrity. Uh, but, but of course, Sharia courts have to have higher level because they are in the name of Sharia. Therefore, obviously, you have higher expectation from them. Uh, it will be five past seven o'clock unless it is so important that we should not be able to sleep well tonight. So. <laughs> <laughs> I will sleep well. That counts. Yes, I, I won't take long. Also, add a little bit to what Mr. Shafiroki said. Um, the um, question of uh, unethical implementation of Sharia is certainly very true. But I think we also have to consider that in, in some cases, um, Sharia law itself is unethical. I'm talking about Sharia enactment laws in, um, uh, in, in, in Malaysia. Uh, then this. The example I have in mind uh, is from um, several enactments uh, in some states in Malaysia that criminalize being Shiite. Now, here is not a problem of uh, implementation. This is the problem of the law itself, which is highly unethical and immoral, not to mention against Islamic tradition. Um, so I think if you do a close study of uh, various uh, enactments, you will find that there is not only un uh, the, you know, immorality in implementation but in the law itself. And the other thing I want to mention is that the issue of um, the conservative turn in, in Malaysia, um, the anti-liberalism, anti-Shiism, anti-Christianism has been there for a long time. Um, since the, for example, anti-Shiite enactments um, uh, and this, this idea you know, against the use of Allah among Christians was already there in the 1990s. Um, but the politicians jumped on the proverbial bandwagon after 2008. Um, for example, the anti-Shiism stuff was taking place in the 19, from the 1990s, but the politicians were generally not involved. But after 2008, uh, they came in in a very big way. Um, and, and you know, after you know, Najib became prime minister, it became worse because during his time. Uh, two, in particular, two ministers, Jamil Khair and uh, Zaid Hamdi, um, were, you know, were on the warpath. Um, and I've been myself studying the, the anti-Shiite uh, thing. So it's not only the enactments, you know, implementations of uh, and gazetting of fatwas, but then you also have a political campaign against Shiism, uh, supported by the by the state uh, media. Uh, and statements made by Jamil Khair and uh, Zaid Hamdi uh, but literally hate speech, uh, for which under Malaysian law they would be uh, called up for sedition. Yeah, but of course they get, get away scot free with it. But there's one thing which I think we didn't mention. Um, apart from the political influences, the, the need to out Islamize past and so on, it's the, the, the other fact is Salafi influence in Malaysia. And that is the thing which is you know uh, which has not been. I think discussed openly enough. Uh, Salafi influence, because Malaysia has been inundated, you know, you know very well, you know, uh, in the last few years, Malaysia is inundated with uh, Salafi uh, preachers, particularly during the month of, uh, of Ramadan. Uh, and on certain issues, and, and the Shiite issue is one of them, there are very strong parallels between what Malaysian uh, ulama, who may even be anti-Salafi or anti-Wahhabi, because they issue statements against Wahhabism, but there are very strong parallels between what they say about Shiism, uh, against Shiism, and what uh, Salafis say against uh, uh, Shiism. Thank you very much. Just a question again, I will not be able to say <laughs> <laughs> A lot of 
feedless people. Someone's going to never get to good. <laughs> just two minutes, you know, if I can. Uh, man, man? Just yeah, just this, this quick. Okay. okay. Uh, you know, this uh, law and politics, you know, it happens everywhere. You cannot separate law from politics. Okay. The, the nature of law itself is uh, 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 the demonstration of political interests, made as parties. Uh, you cannot dismantle Sharia, uh, the desire for Sharia, Sharia law in Malaysia, because it has gone uh, in the direction whereby you can't do that. The question is that, why isn't there a good discourse on law itself? Instead of the opposition, you said that you take up a Sharia law or civil law or things like that, but a good discourse on what should be a good law for Malaysia to, to, to develop that incorporates tradition from the, from the, the Muslim uh, tradition and also the, the best from from the Western Church. I think that that our discourse is lacking among the Muslims. So always going back to Islam when they're trying to search something which is not there, and yet they're standing in front of you. The justice from the Western civilization is standing in front of you. I think the lack of discourse on good laws uh, is also the, the reason why the politics become involved in in bad laws. Eh? <laughs> If I may just add... <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. You make sure that she's late. Your husband cannot see the right thing on his No, no, it's just that coming... I mean, it's uh, it's very much tied to what he has said. You know, I was thinking just now, you started off by talking about the late Prof Ahmad Ibrahim, and you said that he was like a father and a teacher to you. And it surprises me that he himself didn't enter into this discourse about good law. When he was in Singapore, after, um, just before he left for Malaysia, he was one of those who objected to the administration of the Muslim law here. He thought that Singaporean Muslims should adopt and accept the Women's Charter. And he compared the Women's Charter's provisions with the, the Muslim Family Law. And he pointed out, in terms of the social well-being of the Muslim community, it would be definitely more advantageous and beneficial for them to adopt a common law because he felt, I mean, he was using the benchmark of what good law was. So it's all to do with, you know, implications, uh, consequences, ramifications, rather than the naming and the labeling of whether this is Islamic law, Sharia, or civil law. Yeah? And, I, and I'm, 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 I'm still thinking about, or often now and then, about what actually has happened when he went over and he was seen to be an architect of Islamization, expansion of Islamic law in Malaysia. Mm. So he could have had that potential, but somehow, I mean, he had that potential to have, you know, develop such an alternative discourse, but that didn't take off. Wasn't he one of the draftsmen for Amla? Yes, for so, yeah, he was the, yeah. I mean, basically, the draftsman. Why did you say that he was projecting, you know? Projecting, you know Government law system for the Muslims. So it doesn't based matter. on his writings, I mean, based on his writings before that, after, after sixty-seven, after got, what year was that? Was in the sixties. I mean, the publication of that book, I think, was in sixty. I can't remember the exact. So after he had a hand in sixty-seven in drafting yes, yes. he changed his mind when he went to Malaysia. Well, it's yeah. also because the religious. Uh, no, but the, the, the drafting may not reflect his his, uh, his thoughts on it. Yeah, it's just performing as a citizen mm -hmm. and to draft the law. I think law. the decision was made to have Amla, and since he was in the AG's chambers at that time in the, the best brain, he just drafted it. He may personally not have believed in it. Okay, so I think that's, that's <laughs> one of the other points. I you may want to do this research about uh, <laughs> the genesis of Amla and the draft. <laughs> I think, but I, I think it's a very important question. Uh, question about law, regardless of the attribute of names. Uh, only this can be raised tomorrow in the seminar. Uh, I'm not sure whether this, is this open to the public? Uh, yes, you're invited. <laughs> <laughs> so tomorrow there's a seminar uh, uh, organized by the Malay Studies at NUS. Uh, some of these questions will be able to uh, basically really discuss this uh, with uh, the members of the seminar. So I just want to make sure that you guys make sure that the lecture slips in and she will make sure that she will sleep. <laughs> so I want to really thank everyone for, for, for this uh, uh, exciting uh, discussion. I mean, I cannot but uh, recall the uh, uh, writing, and I was, I was looking for, for, for the citation. Uh, so while, while Halak, my, my, my teacher, wrote in his very first paragraph of his book introduction to Islamic law, he said, the Islamic law, or Shara, has in particular become an ugly term 
as often associated with politics as with the chopping off of hands and the story of women. When endless array of popular books have distorted Sharia's beyond recognition, confusing its principles and practices in the past with its modern, highly politicized reincarnations. Considering Sharia's historical role as the lifeblood of Islam, we have little hope indeed, given these distortions of understanding the history and psychology of as much as one fifth of the population of the world in which we live. And that was the reason he, he wrote the book, The Russian Islam Law, the, 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 the short book. Anyway, uh, I want to thank every one of you uh, for honoring us in this long term discussion. And please join me in thanking Pastor Shah uh, for, for the excellent presentation. And also to Dr. Rafael Naun Musa for his participation. For joining us, and as I also again want to record our appreciation to Dr. Uh, Nuraisha and so as Dr. Fernandez for giving us the opportunity to invite to have Dr. Shah uh, in, 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 in ways. Inshallah, this is not the, your first, it is the beginning of uh, the journey. So, thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum.